everyone. Welcome to the heart of the matter. My name is Abisoye. My name is Dipo Ayo Adeosi. We're here with amazing Dr. Chioma Mwakama. She is a doctor and public health physician. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually yeah. great seeing you here. There's so many you. questions about the public health sector. <laughs> and so I'm here. We'll get to that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Really yes. Yes. <laughs> so we, we're just talking a lot about health, social media, and what is now in our generation as well. But for you, you're a doctor, so I want to know how that started for you, and then we'll talk about other things you do as well. Okay, um, how it started for me was basically how it started for almost everybody, right? Uh, I, I grew up in a, a very medical family. Mm -hmm. So my grandparents were both nurses, and I, I grew up having, I had a few uncles who were doctors, cousins who were doctors. So I just grew up in the medical environment. So there wasn't really much, it wasn't really much of a decision for me saying, mm -hmm. what do I want to study? For the longest time, I just knew I wanted to be a doctor. So I went to school, secondary school, um, then university I applied and I, I got it. I wasn't, I wasn't so, um, I just naturally wasn't the kind of person that was going to write jam twice. Mm. So I, I just said I'm going to apply, so if I don't get it, whatever they give me, I'll just go with it. You know, but and luckily for me, I was able to get it, so I started the journey. And so. That's good. Would you say it was something, well, you were surrounded by doctors, but was it also something you were passionate about? Or it's something that kind of grew within you by seeing other people doing as well? Okay, you know, um, children, I like to liken children um, as um, sponges, mm. right? The sponge is dry, so once you soak it in water, it, it absorbs whatever you soak it in. So mm. basically, I, I, was, I grew up in that environment. It was all I knew, mm. you know, and not like, um, that was totally the only thing I knew, but I just knew that I had keen interest in that because my mom was not a doctor, my dad was not a doctor, my, my parents, my parents were not in the medical line, mm. you know, but I just remember growing up close to my grandma, so I used to go to her clinic and, you know, whenever I'm sick, they, we, they, they always take us there. And I just loved hanging around there. So it's something, I think the passion just came with my environment. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just liked it. And then in secondary school, my best subject was biology. I always like knowing. I'm that kind of, I'm very inquisitive. So I really want to know, this food I'm eating now, how does it eventually start helping my body? Like, mm -hmm. what's the molecular level of this thing? I just loved biology and chemi biochemistry, mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh, yeah, my environment, and yes, I was passionate about it. I wasn't coerced in any way. It was yeah. not forced. It wasn't. I wasn't like. It wasn't like the typical, um, you know, African yeah, family. They say you have to be this. <laughs> yeah, my parents, even with my siblings, they just let you be what you want to be. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be a doctor, and they supported me. So. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I was going to ask you, you know, the if, well, we, we have a lot of questions, but I'm going to be a bit selfish and ask you questions that I've always wondered about when it comes to medicine or anybody in the medical field. Okay. So. For me, you know, um, I know that it takes a long time to become a medical doctor. So you first start with, you know, primary, secondary, everybody does that. You go to university, you have your, I, I don't know what the system quite is here, but it's like you study something in the medical field first, then you go to medical school, yeah, and there's something called uh, housemanship or whatever, yes. then there's some other NYC. thing, it's Before like 50 NYC. years, <laughs> 50 years. <laughs> trying to get your, you know, to become a medical yeah. doctor. But then when you finish that, it's then you specialize. Many people specialize. A lot of people yeah. go into general medicine, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. But some people specialize in, very, which is some things we're talking about yeah. today. But at what point did you decide this is exactly what I want to do? Hmm. I'll be honest. It, it was, well, I wasn't, before I started medicine, yeah. you know, I think the only thing that I noticed I was kind of pushed into you know subtly it wasn't like someone was coercing me or forcing me it was specialty 
Exactly. So my parents didn't force me to study the medicine, but then they just, it was just felt like they were pushing me towards some particular kind of medicine, mm. and that was pediatrics. Pediatric. Because naturally I love children, so they just noticed, mm. ah, anytime she comes back, the children love being around her. Mm. So my mom would literally go to the market. I was like in secondary school. She goes to the market. I'm still struggling to understand the chemistry and biology textbooks. And then she just comes like, ah, I saw this pediatric textbook. I'm like, what is pediatrics? <laughs> You know, so um, that happened even while I was in school. Everybody just felt she loves children. She should study mm. pediatrics. So I, I wanted to do that. So while in pre-med, that was what I wanted to do. Then I got into the clinical school. Man, <laughs> I think... I think every medical student or doctor watching this will practically relate, you know, <laughs> right? So I got into clinical school and, um, wow, first day of pediatrics, I'm like, nah, this is all. Not <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I might not wow. really know what it is I want to specialize in, but I know one thing I want to specialize in, and that's pediatrics. Wow. Yes, because it, it, it's beyond... It, it was beyond you love children, mm. okay? Because at this point, I noticed the fact that I love children made me really emotional around children. And so I didn't want right. to be the doctor that is crying when the child yeah. is crying. Or I didn't want to be that emotional. I didn't, I just didn't want it. I didn't want to be depressed. Like, yeah. I just hate that. I'm not saying it's a depressing um, but you just, it's a lot of yeah, emotional emotion, yeah. And so, mm. I, the very first day, I just, I went back and I felt really sad. And then, coupled with the fact that, man, the lecturers then, man, because, I think it's because the, it, it's children, so children are sensitive, so mm. the lecturers are kind of strict, mm. you know. Stricter, if you, you have to Yeah, be. if you, there's no forgiveness. If you fail this course, you failed it, there's no... Any mistake you make, it was like the toughest thing. When people say, oh, you're in pedo, you're like, I'm in pedo, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just knew pediatrics. So um, I think for me, I started getting interested in dermatology, that skin, mm. yeah, at some point. I, I, I even went ahead, I think during my pre-med transition to clinical school, I um, attended makeup school. I was really interested in creative makeup you know, theatrical makeup and all. Not necessarily the beauty makeup, right? What, the special yeah, effects? Yeah, special effects, effects kind okay. of thing. So I, 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 during my holiday, so we had this six months time where you get to do an elective. And so during that period, I came to Lagos and then I attended House of Tara. That's where I learned mm. special effects, um, which I'm not practically so using right now. But then I learned it, it was really interesting. So I felt, okay, since I'm doing this, dermatology will suit me well if I want to make it like a business and all. So I had interest in dermatology and that was what I was going to do. I mean, like, it's different, like, for diff it was, mm -hmm. it was different a journey stages. getting to different this. Different stages. Yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. I, I knew I was going to do dermatology, got to final year, everybody, even in my final year, if you get my final year, um, what they call that? Is it uh, the when you're graduating graduating class? What they call that book, year book or something? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you still see dermatology. That's what I wrote there. I still have interest in dermatology, but I am going. I'm not going to go through the um, um, residency route. I just yeah. would, you know, go through diploma or something okay. else and go straight to dermatology. You know, growing as you just keep growing, you realize it's not just that straight route. As you said, you have to go this, do this, do this. Mm -hmm. There are different yeah. routes. Oh, yeah, there are different yeah. ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be only residency yes, for you. So for me right now, no. it's public health. And uh, it was because I realized that um, prevention is cheaper yes. and better than cure. So if, if I'm always feeling sad about all these things, people dying and all, why don't I just help reduce the number of people who have to get to the point where they die? But now moving on from that to okay, now you, you also see how the things that hurt you and that's something you can go off on and say, okay, this is something I'm passionate about in a different way and something you can do. So I want to move more into that space of the needs you're seeing in the health space in Nigeria and how you're meeting those. I think it's, it's a, it's a multi, multifactorial thing. It's not just the government, it's also the people, you know. And I, I keep saying that number one challenge we have in Africa and, and also Nigeria is poverty. You know, poverty and education so we have a lot of poor people and we have a lot of people who are not literate and then we have the literate people who are not so literate mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah because we have some people because education these days the way it's tailored in nigeria you see many people just going to school to pass exams mm -hmm. but then we forget that you're actually going through that system 
to be able to be empowered to help this system. Mm -hmm. So we just go through it and then you come out and then you ask the average student, okay, what are the job opportunities in your space? And you're like, hey, I wonder if my uncles will give me a, give me a job mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. like, that's not what it's meant to be. So I, this, these are the two challenges. So the, the problem I've, I've identified is that from the aspect of the people, people are poor. Mm. And so because they are poor, they can't afford the health care mm. here because the government hasn't provided proper insurance. Yeah. Our, I was talking about it yesterday on social media. Our national health insurance scheme is still yet to get there. You know, currently it's covering less than 5% of a population of 200, about 200 million people, 5%. So it means that over 95% of Nigerians are paying out of pocket. And so I said it that um, it means that the average Nigerian is one major illness away from poverty. Like you just need one major illness, bam. And I just, I, sorry, I just want to ask before we move on. That those numbers are really alarming, and I think it's important. It's right up your alley. It's important that people know the actual facts. Mm -hmm. So when you say five percent, on, only five percent have um, uh, are covered, you know, by insurance. insurance. Who, who's that five percent? Do you mean is five percent a, a, a combination of? different people who work in different companies who are able to get insurance or no, what no. is that? No, I'm talking about the National Health Insurance okay. Scheme. You know, so that National Health Insurance Scheme ha has about four arms. So it covers different sets of people, students, family mm -hmm. people, but mostly because of the other part of the problem, education, mm -hmm. most people don't even know what they're entitled to. I didn't even know we had that. Oh, I was yeah, like, yeah. I need to get a job to get insurance. I didn't know <laughs> that. Like, right? NHIS. As, yeah, yeah, NHIS, like yes. Right. Yeah. So um, for the private, there we have the private insurance, HMOs, which people are used right. to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, yeah. so they also are under the NHIS, but then they are privatized, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but then the national one that comes directly, that's the NHIS, mm -hmm. you know, it covers both government workers, students, mm -hmm. um, it also covers, they also have packages for like communities, mm -hmm. you know. But the thing is, because people are not aware, the government is not putting out enough word out there. So people know this thing is available for you. This is how to get it, you know. So people are not, um, we have a problem of people not going for what they need. Mm -hmm. And then for those who are going for it, they are not getting adequate um, coverage because it's it's not enough for you to, get, to be on an insurance plan. Mm -hmm. You should be, be on an insurance plan that covers your basic needs, not sometimes some, People come to the hospital and then we're telling them, see, your insurance doesn't cover this. It doesn't cover this. And they're like, what does it cover? Mm. You know, and I, I feel that's the problem. So poverty and education. So people present very late because they don't have money to pay for those mm. necessities. And then also because, um, because they don't have money, they go to the nearest chemist, yes. you know, to mix drugs for mm. them. <laughs> and then we have those who go to the herbalist and those just, we, that's why I said the problems are obvious. People just buy. So when they come to the hospital, they are dead or dying, mm. yeah. you know? So when you come to the hospital um, in that condition, <coughs> the, excuse me, the um, hospital facilities are not enough to take care of you in that stage, yeah. you know? So that, that problem also is something that is really challenging because um, when you come to the hospital, you just believe that all your problems should be solved. I'm now with the doctor, right? But then, only that, so much. yeah, there's just really so much. So what I just preach is prevention. Yeah. So. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go on a quick break because there's so much and there's a lot we wanna ask you, um, but we talked about identifying um, um, sort of like where you, your passion comes from for yeah. what you do now, but we'll talk a lot more about the actual things that you do when we get back from this break. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. My brother is an addict. He dropped out of school in 2015 and all he does is eat, smoke weed and drink alcohol. He gets violent and would destroy stuff just to get his way. He's been in and out of rehab four times and my parents think it's some kind of spiritual force that needs to be prayed away. I'm afraid for their lives and for my brothers. Please help.
Family life is very important to me because I see the family as being at the center um, of God's redemptive plan for mankind. Every community has the family as its basic unit. It's the building block of any society. Family life is a topic which hardly gets the attention it requires. For me, it addresses a lot of things we don't usually talk about. So I, I bring this episode of Family Life every week, talking about one segment or the other of family life. We talk about marriage, how do you make marriages better? We talk about parenting, how you deal with tough, difficult children. We talk about things like divorce, childlessness. We talk about adoption. You know, we, we talk about a whole variety of things on family life with Wale Adifaras. I love the fresh perspectives that Pastor Wale gives while still focusing on biblical principles. I believe that if people know better, they will do better. And so it's important that we, we give family life the prime of place uh, and the prime of attention. At the moment, we are reaching eight states of the Federation, and our goal is to be able to reach all 36 states. And so we're looking for partners that will join hands with us, support us in getting this out. Remember, as you join to support or to partner with us in making sure we're able to expand this program beyond our, our present reach, um, you are doing something for your nation. Welcome back to the heart of the matter. We're back with the amazing Dr. Chioma. And we're just talking a lot about your passions and interests and getting to your journey to public health. And now just with the idea of, I mean, the healthcare system in Nigeria, yeah. the state we're in and the idea of prevention. I mean, we say prevention is better than cure. And I mean, we're talking about the NHIS and so many things people don't know about the actual access we have to insurance here. So just moving along, continue along the line of prevention. I want to find out more about what you're doing specifically in like creating awareness and health. Okay, um, so currently I, I work with my organization, Smile With Me Foundation. So SMILE, SMILE stands for, it's an acronym, it stands for Saving Many Important Lives Every Day. Oh. Yeah, so it also, it's, it goes two ways. Mm. SMILE, like save, save many important lives every day with me or smile with me. So in both ways, we're, we're preferring solution. <laughs> so, I like that. So we, um, we, we officially started in 2017. And um, we, I started Smile With Me because I, I was tired of seeing people, you know, as I said, die in the mm -hmm. hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was also tired of um, people, you know, talking about saying, I don't know, mm. or I didn't know, because mm. it just always comes up when you're like, why didn't you come on time? Why didn't you? So people always say, I didn't know. So what we do in Smile With Me Foundation is that we're a health education and health aid centered NGO. Mm. So we're meeting those two needs. So we educate people, we take health awareness to people where they are, mm. on social media, on the internet for free, you know, we go to communities, local communities, um, even the low and middle class, even the high class, it's, it's everybody. But then, of course, we know those who can really access this information are within the low and middle class. So we take the health education to communities, educate people. But then, you know, you can't just come to someone who doesn't have much and then just, you know, mm -hmm. preach the gospel of health to them and then go and say, thank you, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. You know, most of them come expecting. And that's where the um, angle of poverty I mentioned earlier comes in. Most people can afford these things, so we can't just come talk. So we raise funds um, in the organization for people. So because we're focusing on prevention, we're not just, we don't just do the average outreach where people come and then give them drugs mm. and you know, give them, a lot of people are doing that already, but what we do differently is that we give preventive health aids. Mm. So we screen for cancers, mm. we screen for free, um, we screen people for cancers, we screen people for um, 
common sexually transmitted infections, mm -hmm. hepatitis B, you know, HIV, mm -hmm. and all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, those no, um, non-communicable diseases that are prevalent in our environment, hypertension. So instead of just, we don't do the cure where we give you the drugs, we give you, we mm -hmm. check your BP. Mm -hmm. So we basically give preventive health aids to people. And then um, we, we also have, for now, we have um, started giving some curative kind of aids, but that's an aspect of cancer, mostly cervical and breast cancer. Mm. So we started specifically, if you check our work, it's, it's almost always centered around cervical cancer because um, it, it was really under discussed. It, it's, it's still an under discussed area. So most people don't even know what cervical cancer is. Mm. You know, so we were like, what? I, I knew about this um, <clears throat> because I lost an aunt to cervical cancer and it was really a very it was it was a really um, downtime and um, so she's my friend's mom so my very close friend so she's like an aunt to me mm -hmm. so um, when she she died at a time that was not really <laughs> it was, mm -hmm. no time is good to die mm -hmm. right but then it was a very because we thought she was getting better so that journey mm -hmm. for of cervical cancer the journey and then dying was really very it made me angry Mm. So I researched cervical cancer a bit more. I re of course, as a doctor, I already knew, but then I found out that cervical cancer is um, the second. It's it's almost hundred percent preventable. Um, wow. Yeah. In fact, some people say it's hundred percent preventable. The only hundred percent preventable cancer in the world, but then it's the second most common cancer in Africa. Wow. How? Like, it's like you've <laughs> seen something you can prevent and they're telling you, oh, you can prevent this 100%. People are still dying from it. But then I realized people are dying because they don't know about it. Mm, they don't even know what to do yeah, mm. to prevent. So I started um, educating people about cervical cancer and what to do, you know, identifying risk factors and what to do to prevent. And then in addition, we started um, giving screening, screening women for cervical cancer and also vaccinating the young girls because vaccination works between the ages of 9 to 26 most people don't know about it, and it's not in our um, expanded program for immunization in Nigeria. The HPV vaccine is not in our expanded program for immunization as a country. We are still moving for that. We are begging the federal government to include it because if so, these young girls... So, sorry, that HPV vaccine, you're saying it's one of the preventive yes, measures? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, it's human papilloma, vi um, human papilloma virus. And it's not included vaccine. when you're... Because when you're, it's immunization you get as a child. It's yes, not included. it's not included. So wow. we're begging them to include it because it's killing women. It, it's, it's moving fast, like from what level now is second, who knows? The first is breast cancer. So it's almost competing with breast cancer. So something you can prevent by a simple vaccination from age nine, why don't you just include it? Mm -hmm. So what we just do is um, give health information mm -hmm. online. And also, in addition, um, because I, I, have, I had to go train in digital marketing, mm -hmm. You know, so I teach um, medics mm -hmm. and health organizations how to properly use social media to drive their businesses in healthcare, mm -hmm. or to also drive health education in whatever they are doing, how to use those health social enterprises, how to push them on social media. Because a lot of us in healthcare, we're really all about the book. Mm. You know, we don't really know how to socialize. Mm. We go out there and we just put out jargon online. You want to talk to the, ba the average Nigerian mm -hmm. and you're using words like, uh, what, what <laughs> I don't know, pancytopenia, you know? Mm -hmm. You just have to break it down mm -hmm. and let people understand. Don't impress yourself. Mm -hmm. Most of us just talk to feel like a doctor, but then you want to help this person talk, speak their language. So mm -hmm. we teach um, people how to, how to communicate, communicate online and mm -hmm. use digital media, you know, to push their businesses too. I was going to say that I think it's fantastic because you talked about the free services covers the fact that, you know, a lot of Nigerians, you mentioned the two areas that identified poverty. Yeah. And then this also, um, the communication aspect speaks to giving people information and on two levels, giving the average people information, but also giving your colleagues um, tools to communicate yes. with people. So yes. that's really great. But I want to talk um, specifically about this idea of going to Google to... <laughs> Uh, you know, because I think I think for me it's accessibility. You know, yeah. unfortunately, before you see a doctor, you probably are able to get on Google. 
you know, yeah. to ask questions. And unfortunately, Google can lead you down a rabbit hole when it comes Thank to trying you. to find out. Thank you very much. What your <laughs> sim symptoms add up to. If you just if you just type in headache on Google, you're going to see a lot of things that will make you have stronger headache, stronger. like for days. Because you're going to see cancer, you're going to see... It starts from the worst, it's like, it just goes so this way. How do we know what is right and what is wrong? Because Google is supposed to be a reliable platform, no? Google is just a search engine. Okay. So it's, it works on... Um, it's, it just works on metrics, you know, some metrics to push the... Uh, push some, I don't know, push engagement or push yeah. the highest... The ones with the highest metrics that are mm. matching... people read more. Yeah, so read more and all that. It just, is yeah, so it's a search mm. engine, right? Okay. It, it's a search engine, just like um, Bing and all that. So people don't understand that. It's not about going on Google. Mm. You need to check verified websites mm. on Google. There are, yeah, there are medical websites on Google. You know, I, I can just start calling names now. But mm. then you, even you as a person, you know some sites, even though those sites can give out what should be the risk factors, causes mm. and all, and it could also be a cause of concern for you. Mm. So in addition, uh, um, in addition to knowing about your symptoms, because that's what it is until you go to the doctor who gives mm -hmm. you a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So you learn about your symptoms. You, all you just know is it could be this or it could be this. So now, but you still need to go back. Where we have a problem is not with people knowing about their disease or their mm. condition. It's people trying to look for treatment on Google. Mm. So people just go and you find out, okay, this is it. And this is what I should do. Mm. Who told you to do that? Mm. You know, unless it's a doctor telling you, okay, sometimes you say these are the home remedies or the first aid before. And first aid is before you go to the, ho the hospital, which means you still have to go to the mm. doctor. So fine, go on Google if you have the strong heart mm. to go on Google, go to the verified websites. And once you find out more about um, the disease, even these days when you come to the clinic, we tell you this is diagnosis. We tell you what we can about it. And we'll tell you, okay, if you want to find more about it, go on Google, mm. find out more. Sometimes you don't even need to tell the patient. Mm -hmm. They just say, doctor, what did you say the name? You say, no <laughs> go problem. on, yeah, <laughs> no problem, you know. So the, okay. the challenge is that um, people try to look for a cure Mm. on social media and because I, uh, I always tell my colleagues that people are the social media has happened there's no going back mm. we're only going forward so we need to look for solutions take these things to people so i'm really glad that we have health innovations right mm. now um, um health technology is coming up so you can even assess there are apps for you to assess doctors you know on your phone right mm. on your phone you can talk to a doctor you definitely need to go to the hospital, you jump those long queues, yeah. talk to a doctor, book an appointment. There are a lot of apps. I know a lot of my colleagues doing wonderful work in that space. So I feel that they are solving problems. So mm. we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Gradually. So I'm advising people, use those apps, Google the symptoms, but don't, don't Google the yeah. cure. Unfortunately, that's kind of all the time we have, yeah. but I think you've given us some really important gems to, to, to think about and some things to further research yeah. um, and research in the right way. Like yeah, in the right way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how was it for you, Abisoy? Uh, Anything? Yeah. <laughs> I learned <laughs> so much with just the idea of like prevention, 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 and just with the systems, we can't keep blaming the government. So mm. we need individuals to step out and take those innovative steps to see how they can reach people. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's a great job you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for helping us and giving us light. Light, right? Great. <laughs> all right, guys, that's all we have for this episode. But you can follow the conversation on Instagram and Facebook at HOTM TV and on YouTube at HOTM channel. Until next time, my name is Dikbo Ayo at DOC. And I'm Abisui. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, guys.